Good morning, good morning. Welcome to God's house this morning, people of God. Are you glad you're here? Awesome. Ready to worship Jesus, our King? All right. I am Pastor Tony Bowes. A welcome to also those that are online this morning, watching live. What a privilege that is, technology. Um, if you are a guest with us, I'd love to meet you after the service in the back, outside by the lobby. If you're newer to this place, you haven't seen me before, uh, I'd love to meet you. I'm Pastor Tony Bowes, one of the pastors here. Um, and it'd be great to give you a gift if you're a first-time guest and just to get to know you a little more. Just one announcement this weekend, this, this marriage retreat weekend. I see a lot of couples missing uh, that are usually at 11 today, but they are getting blessed uh, and, and on the marriage retreat along with Pastor Joe and several of our worship folks. Uh, this is the announcement. It's for the men of our congregation. It's men project night, men's project night. Um, and it's just a great thing. I'm involved in two. But as you know, those of men who have gone with me to build homes in Mexico, Pastor Tony does not do well with tools. So that's why I need your help. I mean, we, we have had so many of these over the past couple years. And really, men of the congregation, you have saved us thousands and thousands of dollars to do things on our own. It's a simple thing to sign up online. You get fed in the beginning. You don't have to worry about cooking or cleaning up because we got a great men's team that takes care of us so that we're well fed. Don't eat too much because we do need you to work. But then you're out of here by 8.30. And the most important thing about this is that you get to get to meet just other guys in our congregation. Regular guys that do a lot better with tools than I do. And that's where I kind of learn. And then after I rub shoulders with them, you know, I wink and say, hey, you know, I'm the pastor here. I got a project for you. No, I don't do that. Uh, but it is great to be able to just make this home like our home and to make it look good. Uh, and so that's uh, the privilege that we get to do. So I invite you as men of our congregation to be involved in that. Why don't you stand up, welcome each other to God's house this spring morning. Good morning. Welcome to church this morning. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but is unseen. The Lord before us. We're going to start with, I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. Let's go. Oh, the author of 
Sing a place to hide this week. 
some amazing hand clapping. Awesome, awesome. You know, sometimes, um, just confessing some of the doubts that I have at times, I was in a Bible study this past week on my own, reading the Word, feeling pretty good, and getting all thoughtful about God, and then I get these thoughts in my head as, who made God? Where did God come from? What, why is He invisible? What's going on? And uh, I get a text from Dee asking me, to lead us in this affirmation in Colossians, verse 15 to 20. And I opened it up and started reading the very first verse, which we're all going to read. But I'm going to read this first verse right now. The sun is the image of the invisible God. And when that hit me, it's like, oh, Lord, you are so good. He just ministered to me. Tim, don't worry about it. I'm an invisible God. So let's read this all together. It gives us a picture of God. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Amen. Let's sing the rain, too. The rain of darkness now is ended in the kingdom of light in the kingdom
there is no doubt you reign above it all. There's no doubt. And where were you in the 2024 solar eclipse? This is where I saw this picture. No, Jesus wasn't in the, in, the, in the middle there. I was on the soccer field, painting our soccer fields, of course, right, to, to make it ready for the season. And I saw for the first time with glasses the eclipse, 95% of whatever Detroit had. And I pictured in my mind this song as I'm preparing. And I see this, that he truly reigns above it all. But yet we are sinners and we have doubts. God, do you really reign in my life? Are you truly sovereign? I don't know about you, but that's why I come to church. To hear those promises to me over and over again. That he truly is sovereign. Oh, sovereign Lord. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, Jesus is Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, you reign above it all. You came to make the invisible God visible. So when we doubt, point us to you. Point us to the cross. You are the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus. So reign above our lives, over our lives. Reign above all the countries and kingdoms of this world who are hostile to each other right now. We think of what's going on in the Middle East. We think about Iran and Israel and Syria and all those places, God, in the Middle East who need you to be sovereign and reign. So in, in the midst of war, God, bring peace. Maybe not the physical peace that, that we all look to, but you can do. But the spiritual peace, the peace that makes a right relationship between me, us, and you, God, right through the shed blood of Jesus. Reign above our marriages as those that are over our mar uh, the marriage retreat right now, God. All those couples that you would draw them near to yourself. We thank you for marriages. We thank you for relationships. And we ask that you would reign through all of them. Maybe we're going through rough times right now in relationships. And we doubt that you do reign. But help us, God, understand what the truth of it is. That Jesus, you came for us. You died on the cross. You rose again from the dead to give us life eternal. We thank you for that. Reign above our employment, God. If we're seeking new work or opportunities, be that provider. 
reign above our bodies, God, if we're f- suffering with health issues or mental, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, all of it, God. Help our own sinfulness, the devil, this world, flee from us in the name of Jesus that we might understand better who you are. You reign, you rule, you're our king. We thank you for that. And Jesus, we thank you for teaching us to pray. So we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. All God's people say, amen. Amen. You may be seated. As I invite the baptismal families forward to to witness what God is going to do in their lives, what a joy it is to families today. And as they they go and and light uh, the candles for these kids, I, I, I remember these words from Scripture, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of, do you remember how to finish that? What is it? Light of life. The light of life. This isn't physical life we're talking about. We're talking about spiritual life in a spiritual kingdom that I'm going to be talking about in my message. But it's a celebration today. That's why we have candles. To point these these children and their families to understand what God is doing Because Jesus' words in Scripture from John 3, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. So today's an opportunity for all of us to witness God's actions. Well done, Gideon. And uh, his action of love and mercy to us all. And we're reminded as we see this about our own baptism. God's word clearly says that we're conceived and born sinful and spiritually dead in our sin. And we need forgiveness. But the good news of the gospel is this, that he sent his one and only son, right? He gave his son to us to die for the sins of the whole world and that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So baptism isn't the pastor's idea. It isn't the church's idea. It's God's command and promise. Jesus said this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. How? Baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And then he gives us this promise, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And God has made a way for little ones too, so that the kingdom of God might be open to them. In the book of Acts chapter 2, Peter says, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So now, as parents and as sponsors, if you want to turn and, and face this direction, you understand that this calling and offering of God, it's your task to confess that with the whole church, the faith that we believe in, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in whose name these children are to be baptized. After they've been baptized, you're at all times to remember them in your prayers, put them in mind of their baptism, that as they grow up, you place in their hands the Holy Bible, you bring them to church, right, provide for their their further instruction in the Christian faith so that they might grow up to lead a godly life to the praise and honor of Jesus Christ. Do you as parents and as sponsors promise to fulfill these obligations? If so, answer, I do so promise. promise. Loud and clear. Well done. I ask you as a congregation who are connected in love and fellowship to these little ones being baptized, you promise to pray for them, to help them in their Christian life, to model for them a a godly life in both word and deed. If so, congregation, would you answer, we do so promise. We do so promise. And I ask you as parents and sponsors of these children, do you renounce the devil in all his works and all his ways? If so, answer, I do. Will you continue steadfast in the true Christian faith? Be diligent in the use of God's word and sacraments and lead a godly life even to death? If so, answer, I do so intend with the help of God. Again, loud and clear. That's awesome. (laughs) Madeline, let's start with you. Come on up. (laughs) 
Madeline Ann Hepner, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I know it hurts, it's cold. And I place on your forehead the sign of the cross and on your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Jesus who is now your Savior and King. Amen? Amen. You want to go first, Gideon? Come on up. Do you have, uh, I forgot to, to ask if you had the, that's my bad, the, the baptismal book. To see, this is the godparent's job. This is great. She's on it already because Pastor Tony skipped this part in the, in the thank you. And we'll need three more. <laughs> Gideon, Titus, Qualioto. Come on up here. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You can hold this. And I place on your forehead and on your heart the sign of the cross to mark you as God's child, redeemed and loved always his child. Amen, amen. Is this Ember? Come on, Ember. Ember Grace Qualioto, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And you can hold this. And I place on your forehead and on your heart the sign of the cross to mark you as God's child forever and always. And he doesn't go back on his promises. Amen. Esther Hope. We have one for her too. You're so good. Esther Hope Gualioto, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And you can hold that, Mom, and I place on your forehead and on your heart the sign of the cross to mark you as God's child. Would you bow your heads and let's pray for what just happened here and thank God. Heavenly Father, you have given new birth of water and the spirit to these children. You rescued them from the dominion of darkness and placed them into your kingdom. You've given them faith and you've washed away all their sins. So we ask that you would strengthen them every day with your grace. You protect their precious faith. May the Lord bless you in all your ways from this time forth and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Turn and face that congregation. Let's celebrate. This is our mighty God. Amen and amen. I want to invite now as you're seated and you blow out those candles so we don't light the church on fire. But literally we are on fire, church, by the way. The spirit is in us. Amen. And we want to see his kingdom grow. And part of that kingdom growth is our next gen team. So I want, to, I want you to welcome Sam. Go ahead and give him a hand. Thank you, God, for Sam. He's going to share with us some ways to serve. Awesome, awesome, awesome. It's a beautiful morning. Um, I just wanted to share just a, a couple opportunities that we have for you guys um, to be able to jump in with our, with our next gen ministry, which is really just our birth through young adults. Um, we are experiencing a, a lot of growth in our in our kids in that in those time frames in those age frames and Deb who works with our our elementary group was up here um, last week and shared some of that which is super exciting uh, it's really awesome we're experiencing the same kind of growth in our middle school and high school ministries too which is again just absolutely awesome um, because it means more kids and more students are getting to to be around really amazing people and being led to to know and reflect. Um, who Jesus is and know who he is um, in their lives, which is just um, just an awesome thing. And what I wanted to share this morning with you guys is that you have an opportunity to, to give of yourself. Um, many of you know this passage from John chapter 3, verse 16. It says, for God so loved the world, I'm going to need your help in a second. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his one and only son so that we would not perish but have eternal life. So one of the ways that we can be the most like Jesus in our life is when we give of ourselves, when we give of our time, when we give of our talents or the gifts that, that God's given us and we administer those to others. And so when you give, one way to give is to, to literally jump in and give of yourself and, and as a volunteer with our, with our kids and our students and even the little ones. Um, honestly, especially the little ones, getting to see families um, 
baptized their children this morning. One, we all said, I heard it, I heard it, we all said, we do so promise. I heard you say it. <laughs> um, one of the best ways that you can fulfill that promise is by serving. And obviously, like we say, you can model your life as, as following Jesus. You can pray for these children. But if you give of yourself and your time to serve, that is one of the best ways to fulfill that promise. And I get to see it every week um, with our volunteers. It's really phenomenal. Now, you may be thinking, but there's something about me that is not going to work out with those kids. It's not, I can't do it. I'll pray. I'll live a life that follows Jesus, but I cannot <laughs> spend an hour or two or whatever that looks like to serve um, just because you're wiring or maybe. So we're going to bust a couple of myths this morning about why you may not think you can do it. So first is that you have nothing to offer. You have nothing to offer them. Uh, you can't offer them anything, the kids, the students, the teenagers. You you have nothing to offer. Some of you may have think, thought that before. The truth is that that is a lie um, and that you're here, you're breathing. And so that I know you have, you, you've got some life experience. You have something, you're sitting here in a church, you have some desire to learn about who God is. Those two things, that is, that is plenty. That tells me what you might have to offer a, a child or a student um, or, a, or a fourth grader. And, and the value that God has given you, the gifts that God have, has given you are really important. And, that, and they are, they're valuable to those kids. The second thing, that the myth that we can bust is that your personality is just pretty horrendous when it comes to kids like that. It's not for you. Just your personality won't work out, right? Um, maybe you just think like, it's got to be like, you got to be like this guy and this girl who's just like always up here and always turned up. Not the case at all. But if you have that personality, that's great. But if you're just like, pretty calm and maybe more introverted and you look over and you walk by the kids and you go, can't go in that room. That is not for me. I will send my kid happily into that room, but uh, not for me. We need both of those kinds of people. Um, and the reason we need both of those kinds of people is because we have all of those kinds of kids, right? We have kids who are super crazy and energetic and we have kids who are much more reserved and enjoy the time to themselves. Um, and that really goes from the time that they're one, two, three, four, up until they're 17, 18. Um, and as adults, we all know this, right? We have different preferences. But your personality is specific, and I think that it's, it's part of how God has designed you. And I believe that it's actually intentional, and it's something that you can offer um, to the next generation. And so what we'd love for you to do today, um, there's a little display on the way out to your left. You'll see the nice bright balloons. Um, and there's just on one side of the card, there's, there's kind of a value that we believe as a team. Um, is important and that we think that can apply to you. And then on the other side, there's a, a, a short sentence or, or quote just from a student or a leader. Um, that is just cool to hear. It's cool to read. Um, as we were collecting them, I was like, this is, it's just really neat. And it shows you the value that we bring and that you can be a part of, that you can be a part of and bring as well to, to the next generation here at Faith. Um, and we would love to just talk to you. And if you're like, you know what, that, sound, like, that sounds like a cool card, but maybe I'm not going to serve, just stop by. We're not going to pressure you into anything. We just want to talk with you and, um, and engage in that conversation. And if you just want to hear about some of the things that God's doing in our kids' ministries and in our next-gen ministries, we would love to talk with you about that. Um, and so that just brings me to, to just sharing just this next slide. If you are here this morning and you're a guest, we are so glad that you are here. Um, but we wanna encourage you, if you call this place home, um, that we would love for you, um, these are the, if you wanna give financially, as I said, the one of the ways that we are most like Christ is when we give and when we live like this, right? It's easy, it's natural to live like this and everything that we get, whether that's our time, whether that's our, our finances and resources, it's easy to live like this because it's mine, right? It's mine. But when we live like this open-handed, we are not more like Christ than in those moments. Um, and it's really beautiful and a powerful thing. It's not natural and it's not always the easiest, but so often it's the most freeing and liberating and then we're following Jesus in a, in a really beautiful way. And so if you call this place home, you can give online or you can give in a basket on your way out today. Um, but we are, we are so excited that you're all here with us this morning. Um, and you can go ahead and stay seated as we, as we watch this video before we continue with our service. Thanks.
right, so if you've been around here uh, for a while, you know this about me. But if you're new to this place or newer to this place, maybe you don't. And it's the fact that I was born in the Philippines um, and had a, a Filipino mother, an American Navy man, a, as a father, and in 1971 moved to the United States, uh, adopted by this U.S. Navy man. He's been my dad for as long as I know. Um, but so Filipino and American, several years ago, I got a shirt for Christmas, and I proudly wear it at the office sometimes when I'm out and about, and it says, American raised with Filipino roots, and you see the American flag and, and, and the Filipino flag there. I love that shirt, maybe some of you, uh, one of the, the members of our church last service said, where can I get those? And I said, I don't know, ask my wife, uh, where can you get those, honey, so Amazon or something? Anyway, uh, she wanted to get it for a Filipino neighbor uh, that was in my shoes like that. Um, one of my daughters, Kristen, uh, she wasn't born in the Philippines. All of them were born in St. Louis, Missouri. But she played for DePaul University for four years. Her last COVID year, she played at Iowa State. And right now, she's investigating how to get uh, dual citizenship to play for the Filipino national team. And if you don't know uh, the, about the Filipino women's national team, I'm going to tell you because they, in 2000. 23 did the first thing first time ever in the Filipino history made it to the World Cup and it's amazing for, for that because yeah the United States rules uh, you know that that on the women's side but but Filipinos you know they're, they're catching up they, they, they really are uh, and and several of those Filipinos you see uh, have dual citizenship so my daughter said hey dad can you investigate a little bit about how it is that you might get dual citizenship from the Philippines and, and so that I could get dual citizenship so she could play for the Filipino national team. I said, sure, honey, let me try to do that. Well, let me tell you, as I was writing this message and it's been about two month process, I still don't know today if I'm a natural born Filipino or if I'm a natural born American. I have no idea. I'm going to have to get an immigration lawyer and I started reading on my own from the council and the embassy and blah, blah, blah. And it says, taking another oath of allegiance, having to pay taxes, you know, swear this, blah. I it terrified me. I'm like, I mean, I, I like the, I really do like the country of my birth, but there's nowhere better to live than the United States of America. So I'm glad to be a U.S. citizen naturalized in 1984. Uh, but also, uh, as we talk about this, we're talking about countries and kingdoms today. So I was thinking about the world. You know how many countries in the world? It's a 300, 500, 150 about 195, so is the world meter says, 195 countries in the world that have all kinds of different types of government. Some are dem democratic, right? Some are autocratic, closed autocratic would be countries like North Korea, China, Saudi Arabia. There's electoral autocratic, like Russia and India and Iran and Iraq. There's electoral democracy, like the U.S. and Canada and then Brazil, South Africa. Most, you know, people, when you're born, you're citizens of that country. But in our time in history right now, there's a multitude, isn't there, of places that we can go to in our lifetime and live. You know, prior to 1960s, a third of the countries in the world didn't even allow dual citizenship. But now you find with so many multiple like cultural identities and multi-ethnic groups, do you know anybody that is a dual citizen? Maybe you're a dual citizen right now. Raise your hand if you're a dual citizen. Awesome. Good to have you dual citizens. Uh, maybe I'm one too and I don't even know it. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Uh, but as I mentioned worldly countries and kingdoms today, it really sets the stage for this. We're going to talk about spiritual citizenship. Spiritual citizenship, not physical citizenship. Because if you think about it, maybe you haven't thought about it in a while, but that's a pastor's job to help us think about spiritual things, right? That's my job. There are only two spiritual kingdoms. Only two spiritual kingdoms. What are they? What are they? Yeah, and they exist beyond in addition to the earthly king kingdoms or countries, governments that we live in, right? It's this spiritual realm that is invisible. It's otherworldly. We can't see it, but we understand that God does exist. We understand that there is a Satan and he's real and there are demons and there are angels, good and bad, and things happen in our lives that like we can't explain. 
So it's invisible and it's hard to understand and maybe we'll never understand it until the day we meet Jesus, right? Until he comes again or he calls us home. But the truth of the matter is this. Every single person who's ever lived on this earth, no matter what physical kingdom or country they're in, they are either belonging to God's spiritual kingdom or Satan's kingdom. And so we keep in mind this about the kingdoms and really... Um, what, what I put on the screen is this, all that really matters, the most important thing that really matters to us is our spiritual citizenship. So off we go to talk about this topic, and I'm going to blast you with all kinds of Bible verses because I'm a true believer that God's word is more powerful than any words I could ever say. And so when I read those and you, you know, start to frantically write the reference point down, relax, you can always review this message on video, Right? Or you can email me, or you can just write down the ones that really, like, just pique your interest. So here we go. Ready? John chapter 18. Jesus is in front of Pilate. Pilate says, hey, are you a king? And Jesus says, you are right. You're right in saying that I'm a king. This is the reason I was born. But then he goes on to say, my kingdom is not of this world. It's otherworldly. My kingdom is from another place. Colossians chapter 1. For he, that's God the Father, has rescued us. From where? Well, this dominion of darkness. And he brought us into the kingdom of light, the son that he loves, that's Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4, the God of this age, Satan. What has he done? He's blinded the minds of unbelievers so they can't see the light of the gospel. Ephesians chapter 6, our struggle, it's not against flesh and blood. Who's it against? The rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, but also against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's Satan and his demons. Ephesians 2, the ways of this world, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's Satan, the spirit who is now at work, truly at work, hard. Not against those who are already in his kingdom, but against those who are not in his kingdom, right? Who are disobedient. Luke chapter 17, these are Jesus' words, the coming of the kingdom of God. It isn't something that can be observed. Nor will people say, well, here it is, there it is, because the kingdom of God, well, it's, it's in our midst. Jesus, what does that mean? What are you talking about? Some invisible kingdom, otherworldly kingdom. You see, a lot can be learned from, a, from these verses. That's just kind of a sample because it's all throughout the scripture. Spiritual kingdoms, and we're going to really begin to understand and ask the question, well, what spiritual kingdom did we start out in when we were conceived and when we were born? You know the biblical history. You know the Bible story. You know the first people that God created. They were Adam and Eve, right? And they're in this garden, and God loves them, and he truly gives them his whole image, like they are perfectly God's creation. They have the true image of God, and they get a choice. They get a choice to follow him or not. And did they listen? Did they listen fully? They disobeyed. Do you listen fully? Well, neither do I, right? We disobey because our father and mother were sinners, and their father, and just all the way to Adam. And Eve, that's the storyline of what happens. And the truth of the matter, we are all beginning in Satan's kingdom. That's a hard thing to think about, isn't it? To understand. Romans 5, though, repeats this truth several ways. Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to only the bad people. Because only the bad people sinned. Is that what the Bible says? Several times in Romans. So no, it doesn't say that. It says all, all people. That means me. That means you. Because all sin, the many, which is just another way St. Paul writes, because it means all, the many are all died by the trespass of one man, the result of one man's sin. This judgment is followed, and it brought condemnation. One sin, one trespass resulted in condemnation for only the bad people that are in Satan's kingdom. No. For all people, through the disobedience of the one man, the many, or that means all were made sinners. All were made sinners. So we, th- that's the truth of the matter, that we're conceived, we're born into sin. At the first moment we exist in the womb, we don't belong to God, we belong to Satan. 
That's the hard truth to understand because how can these little beautiful babies, the one right in front of you is sleeping, right? They just baptized, right? They, they, we saw what God did, right? How can they be not innocent? They're perfect and pure, right? Psalm 51 says this. Surely I was sinful at when? Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And you would think if that was not true, by the way, everything in the Bible is pretty true, right? <laughs> it's like all true, okay? You think when Jesus was born by the Holy Spirit, he was the only one that's perfect, right? You think he would have clarified this. Oh, no, don't listen to that. These little babies before me, they're, they're all good. You think he would have said that? No, he said just the opposite. He tells Nicodemus in John chapter 3 that we all need to be born again. Very truly, I tell you, he says in John 3. That means, like, I really mean it. <laughs> Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless what happens? They're born of water, baptism, and when baptism is given, the spirit is given. Because, but flesh gives birth to flesh. The spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying this, Nicodemus. You're a Pharisee. You should understand these things, that you must be born again. Another, the Greek says, born from above, meaning that you can't do it. It comes from God. Born again. We're subject to the devil's rule and reign in the spiritual kingdom to start with because flesh gives birth to flesh. We're born sinful, and that's handed down from parent to generation to generation. And it manifests itself in so many ways, doesn't it? In countless sins of thought, word, and deed. So the Bible informs us that the eternal destiny of everyone who belongs to Satan's kingdom is this place called hell. And it's a real place, and we're going to go through this kind of verse by verse from different Bible verses. Here's Jesus' words when he talks about Satan's kingdom in Matthew 25. He says, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. As I was reading that for the second time, how do you think Jesus' words were? Do you think it were, depart from me, you are cursed into eternal fire? You think that's how Jesus said it? Or you think Jesus has tears in his eyes looking at all of them who were offered this gift, who understand, right? I'm right here, Jesus is saying. I don't want you to be there because that's prepared where or for whom is it prepared for? The devil and his angels, not for you. Not for you. Apostle John, when he's given this vision in, in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 20, verse 10, he says, The devil who deceived them was thrown into this lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. There would be tormented day and night forever and ever. And there's not enough evers, right? Because it means eternity. It means eternal. So this place called hell is eternal just as much as heaven is eternal. Peter describes hell this way. God didn't spare his angels when they sinned, but sent them to where? putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 8 and 9, there's this warning of eternal destiny to those who, do, who don't belong to God's kingdom. He'll punish those who don't know God and don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. Amen. Should I stop there? Some of you, yeah, Pastor Tony, stop talking. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Thankfully, God didn't respond to Adam and Eve's sin with immediate wrath. He could have, right? He could have. He said, oh, I could have shrugged his shoulders and said, well, they're lost. You know, but no, he gives us the gospel because he says, I'm going to pre promise, I'm going to send a savior, and that savior is going to crush the head of Satan. Praise God. He could have turned his attention away, forgotten all of us, but thankfully, in his grace and his mercy, he didn't. Ephesians chapter 2, though, Paul continues to, to just kind of explain what, what's happening. Uh, as for you, he says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and, and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The Spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us 
also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. And that's the truth. Because this, this flesh still clings to us, right? We still have this sinful nature and we're deserving of wrath. But thank God he did something about it. So the best news is what I'm going to read. And it's all over the scriptures. But one is found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. As Paul writes, he's giving joyful thanks. Giving joyful thanks to the Father. Why? Because he's qualified you. Did you qualify yourselves? No, he has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people. In the kingdom of where? Darkness or light? Light, for he has rescued us. Did we rescue ourselves? No, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption. That means we're brought back, back from the devil's hands, back from this sinful world, and back from our own sinfulness. We have redemp- we've been redeemed, the forgiveness of sins. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? Now I could go, but I still have some more things to talk about. Your citizenship, my citizenship has changed. I did not change my citizenship. Unlike what I'm trying to do now with the Filipino government, I'm not doing it. God is the one who does it. The Bible doesn't say, you know what, you need to choose your citizenship. It doesn't say that. It's just, it doesn't say you need to leave the dark side by your own volition and come to the light. No, who has rescued us? God has. Who has brought us? God has. How? Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, our citizenship has changed. Praise God. He does this through baptism. That's why we baptize babies. They have no idea what's going on. Right? But the power of God and water has brought them into the kingdom of light. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And maybe you weren't baptized as a baby, but maybe you came to know Jesus by the power of his word in many and different ways. That's okay. The means of grace comes all kinds of ways. But the power of God and through the Holy Spirit has rent your heart to say, I don't want to be like I am. I need a Savior. And when you raise your hand and you say, I need a Savior, guess what? God is doing his work. And he's brought you into his kingdom by the power of his holy word and the spirit praise god ephesians chapter one says it this way when you believe guess what you are marked with him with a seal the promised holy spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance we get an inheritance yes (laughs) until the redemption of those who are uh, uh, god's possession you're god's child always and forever 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 21 and 22. Now it is God. Does it say now it is me, Tony, or you? No, it's God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. Did you anoint yourselves? No, he anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, put his spirit in us, in our hearts, as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. That's great news. That's the best news that we can be reminded of all day long. Thank you, God, for Sunday worship, right? That we can be reminded of these things. I want to take you to Matthew chapter 25 again, where Jesus talks about this kingdom. And he says, for those that belong to Satan's kingdom, well, they're going to go away to eternal punishment. Eternal means like a long time. But for those that that he counts as righteous, where do we get to go? To eternal life, to be with him forever and ever and always. That future for those in his kingdom, Jesus announces. Matthew chapter 25 verse 34. Then the king will come to say to those on his right. No, this is the good news though I'm going to (laughs) say. The king will come. Come you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. That's awesome. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, we're reminded, but our citizenship is in where? And we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, from there. That's why I say your citizenship, your spiritual citizenship, my spiritual citizen, that's all that really matters. I'm so thankful that God has done this thing for us. I hope you are too. 
So now, what do we do as fellow citizens of God's kingdom? What do we do? How do we live this life? How do we be active in this spiritual kingdom of our King Jesus? How do we obey? I can't help but think of the range of responses, right? When you become a U.S. citizen, how many of you have ever seen somebody become a U.S. citizen and what they pledge to? It's amazing, amazing thing to, to witness. I just invite you to go see that if you've never, if you've never done that. But, but when you become a citizen, right, and you think about the citizens in this place right now, some, they're not even interested in being involved, right? Maybe they don't even show respect for the flag or respect for their laws or whatever else, right? Uh, but some of us, we do vote, right? We, we know the, the rights. We, we, we talk actively about what's happening uh, about elections, and, and, and we run for public office, right? We discuss what laws apply to our life, and that's a good thing. But as spiritual kingdom, uh, as spiritual citizen in God's kingdom, the Bible also gives us a lot of help. And as I end today, I want to highlight three of those. It's found also in Colossians chapter 4. And, and we're going to go uh, to Colossians 4. If you want to go to your Bibles, on the, most of the, it's always on the screen anyway. But you can feel free to, to go on your phones or in the, in the Bibles to Colossians 4. And we're just going to focus on three kind of verbs of, of being good citizens in, in, in the kingdom of Jesus. And those verbs are this, that we pray, that we act, and that we speak. So Colossians chapter 4, uh, verse 2 says this, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Prayer, that's that first verb to describe how you can be active in God's kingdom. And you're active in prayer, how? Devotedly. There's a Greek word, proskaterete. And you, got, you, you knew that, right? Proskaterete. That means devoted. Devoted means to persist in, to busy oneself with, to, to engage in, to, to, to like not stop. That we have this devotion to praying because we have direct access to the king. I don't know, maybe some of you have direct access to the president right now. You maybe have a cell number or the governor. I don't know. But many of us don't. Right? But we have direct access to the throne of grace. Through the blood and power of Jesus who has done that for us, we can pray devotedly. We can pray watchfully. That means we watch for him to come again. Right? That as we watch, we, we think and we thank God, Jesus, that he's already done the work. He's already won the war. He's already died on the cross. He's defeated Satan. Satan is finished. Praise God. And so we can pray with boldness and thankfulness that he's our king who has done this and we know that he listens to us and, and we're watching for his coming. We pray. But not only do we pray, the second verb is we act. So in verse 5 it says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. We're praying, God open our spiritual eyes so we can see. We act toward those who are not in his kingdom wisely because we know there's an unseen battle. There is a spiritual battle for souls. Satan wants to take not those that are already in his kingdom, but he wants to take all of us back. He wants to take us back. He wants to rob, kill, and destroy our faith. So we act wisely. We go to the word. We pray. We act so that we can be ambassadors, true godly ambassadors of Jesus, our King, so that it attracts. So we pray, we act. In verse 6 then, we get to speak. Because St. Paul says, let your conversation be always full of grace. Seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. I love the way St. Paul writes, so that you may know how to answer. Because that implies that we don't have to initiate spiritual conversations. Because as we're praying for a person who is in Satan's kingdom, Right? And as we're acting like followers of Jesus do, then guess what? Those are conversations that are going to naturally come about. And they're going to ask questions. And when we, they, we ask, they, they ask questions, we're prepared. We're prepared to give an answer. And verse 3 kind of highlights how we, we pray and, and, and what we do when, when that message can go through. It's, it's in verse 3, actually, of Colossians 4. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. It is a mystery, by the way. 
How can a dead person come to life spiritually? Only by the power of God. And we think about praying for open doors. And, you know, I got to this place like 17 and a half years ago. And one of the first things that I saw in this church was all the stinking doors. Not stinking, but, you know, their doors are like, you just, all the, the glass doors, like with all these preschool hands on it, you know, and the custodian staff do such a great job to clean it every day probably, you know, and our dirty hands, there's doors everywhere. Okay, I'm going too long on that. But doors, doors of our preschool that are opened because our preschool teachers are sharing the love of Jesus to these little ones. And guess what? People have got to get to baptize like four of those preschoolers this week on a Tuesday right here. Like this week, the 16th. Isn't that awesome? Because we have open doors in our preschool. Oh, come on. Isn't that awesome? Thank you. Just go ahead. Yeah. There's doors that are open. And, and you know, I'm a firm believer in sports and how uh, families come through those open doors. So our Faith Sports Academy, soccer, basketball, cheer, whatever. Next generation has volleyball. I have sports tonight. I have 24 guys, 25 guys actually, that will be in the gym from 6.30 to 8.30. If you're a soccer player in this place and you want to, you know, do that, please see me. Uh, basketball, I know Tim does that for all these years, right, where we rub shoulders with guys that are not in his kingdom and we share the word of God. We hold weekly Bible studies. Our Iraqi friends that are all through those doors every morning, they're now making coffee <laughs> instead of drinking it. <laughs> We've given them the, the opportunity to do that. They come to my Bible study the, on Wednesday nights. There's a group of Iraqi ladies that are here under Bible study. It is amazing, amazing ways we have open doors for that message to go forth. And I can't help but notice Paul describes these conversations to be always full of grace, seasoned with salt. So here's the question as we close. How can you develop the ability to speak about Jesus with the grace that he's talking about so that, they're, it, that our conversation is kind of flavorful. It's appetizing. How do we talk about Jesus in a way that makes people, you know, their mouth water, if you will? If you will? How does that happen? I think the answer to that is we need to be investing our time with our King Jesus. That we would read God's word regularly, daily, if you will, that we become more appreciative of our citizenship in God's kingdom, right? That we just don't have dull submission, but we come across flavorful to others. A pastor and teacher that I was reading to prepare this message, his name is John Piper. I like what he had to say about this topic. I found it to be very true. It's hard to salt your speech with deliciousness of Jesus when you haven't been enjoying the taste yourself. So true, isn't it? Some of you have gone to my class several years ago. Um, maybe some of you have not, but it's online now. I took some time during COVID to, to make it online. If you go to this website, faithtroy.org, into every relationship. I think for newer small groups uh, or, or even individually, you can go through this. And it really helps in getting the skills to pray, act, and speak. Take a look at that. If you have any questions, you can email me. But church, I pray that today's focus on citizenship, maybe you learned something new about it. I hope it increased your gratitude uh, for our King Jesus. I hope it motivated you. Uh, but really the simple gospel message that we get to proclaim isn't simple. It can be a mystery at times, but it's so simple that little children can understand it. And it's so complex that is, until you live this life, right, we won't understand it all. But yet God has given us his word understand it more and more. We're sinners. Jesus saved us. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for sending your son, our king, Jesus. I thank you that as we live in your kingdom, Lord, we have so many opportunities to share that message, that simple gospel message of what you've done. And so on our hearts, maybe just now, we're, we're grieving for people that we know that, don't, that, are, that are not in your kingdom. And so we just take some moments right now to in our heart of hearts and minds that we would just put your, that name at your altar, at your throne of grace, knowing that in your mercy, you're going to draw all people to yourself. And so do so for that person that are on our hearts right now.
And we pray, Father, that you would continue to draw us to you, to see your son, Jesus, in a greater way each and every time we come to worship. We thank you that we're in your house this morning, and we ask your blessing in Jesus' name.
I, I don't know about you, but when, when I sing that song, I feel like I'm marching. You know, it's like a, a marching song, Citizens of, of the King. So as you march on out of here tonight or today, hear these words from Philippians 3 one more time. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Citizens of God, people of God, as you go out into the world, right, bring that gospel message to those who need it. Amen? Have a great week. You said the darkness.